This talk, or this paper, started out ago, about a year ago when I was talking to a friend of mine named Carl. And Carl, he, um, he's got some problems. One of the problems is that he works for Georgetown. Now, you wouldn't think that's a bad thing, right? Georgetown's a nice place. But he doesn't work for Georgetown in the United States. He works for Georgetown in Qatar. Now, so he, um, he lives in a, basically a, 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 an oil-rich state. And he thought, uh, and what he's interested in is called basic income. I'll say a little bit more about what basic income is in a little bit. So I was talking to him about his latest, latest research project, which is the idea of using sovereign wealth funds drawn from uh, natural resources, in this case, oil, to fund basic incomes. This seems quite a plausible thing to think if you happen to live in Qatar. If you don't happen to live in a oil-rich state, though, you might think, well, hold on, maybe there's some problems with this. And that was sort of what I started to think. So in conversation with them, I was chatting, I was like, well, you can't do that, Carl. You can't use uh, oil to fund your basic income, because that's just going to make your, your basic income program complicit with all the problems of oil. And he said, you know, Steve, that sounds like a really interesting thing to think. And I said, yeah, I know. I, I think I come up with interesting thoughts all the time. <laughs> and then he said, you know, you should write a chapter, or you should write a paper about that. And I said, yeah, you know, I should. That's a good idea. And he said, you should write a chapter for my book. And I said, oh, I now for it. So that's what this is. This is a chapter that's going to come out in a book edited by Carl Weidequist uh, next year, I think, for Palgrave. Um, and it's all called Exporting the Alaskan Mod or something to that effect. So the thought is I'm going to work through a few stages in this paper. First, I'll talk a little bit about what basic income is, then I'll talk a little bit about Alaska and the Permanent Fund Dividend. That's what PFD is, Permanent Fund Dividend. Throughout the paper, I'll make the mistake and call it a PDF. So when I say PDF, I really mean PFD. All right? Then I'm going to say what's wrong about it. And I'm going to talk in particular about a certain way of wrongdoing, a certain mode of wrongdoing I'm going to call complicity. Okay? Now, when I talk about complicity, I'm not going to mean anything too legal. All right. Is there any lawyers in the crowd? I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer not yet. Are there any aspiring lawyers in the crowd? Okay. All right, all right, all right. So you'll have a certain, I would say, doctrine of complicity in your head, right? I'm not going to be referring to that. Rather, I'm referring, though I'll mention it sort of along the way in order to contrast my conception. But the conception I'm using is much more sort of a lay conception. Um, it doesn't require the apparatus of the legal doctrine. So some examples of the conception of complicity. Oh, sorry. So I'll talk about complicity and why why the PFD makes Alaskans complicit, and then I'll try to I'll pose a, a way of solving the problem. Okay. So that's the, those are the bits of the paper. Congratulations, Daniel. Thank you, Steve. That's good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel, you just won the what? What are you? Vice President. You're Vice President. That's a little bit frightening, quite frankly. Anyways, all right, so that, that's how it's going to go. Um, where was it? Right, complicity. So we're all familiar with charges of complicity, right? Um, being sort of leveled around in fairly cavalier fashion. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Right? I'm not going to make any criticism of this. But let's get some examples. So we're familiar, familiar with people being charged with uh, having blood diamonds or maybe wearing sweatshop clothing or perhaps um, what are they, utilizing resources derived from arms manufacturing, slavery. Recently there was a, um, a bit of a kerfuffle at the LSE about monies that were derived from, uh, what's the right, this wonderful phrase, the Gaddafi International Charity and Development Foundation. And the director of the LSE ended up resigning because of his um, actions with respect to procuring and using monies derived from the Libyan regime. So we, that's the kind of complicity I want to get at. The kind of thing we say, well, if you're wearing sweatshop running shoes, you're complicit with the sweatshop manufacturers. And that's not to say that 
Yeah, one way you might have interpreted that, that statement would be to say that, look, wearing such a clothing or something like that endorses the activity. Or you might say, wearing sweatshop clothing is such that it um, contributes to this. So, you know, you're giving them money, right, and sort of, you know, paying for it, and that's going to promote that activity in the sense that there's going to be more of it. You know, there's an incentive to continue to engage in sweatshops. That's not the kind of thing I'm getting at. Imagine if you had a pair of sneakers, let's call them Nike Das. Nike Das sleeper, sleep sneakers, right? Sneakers is not the right word. You guys don't use it with trainers. Nike Das trainers. Somebody offered you a pair of Nike Das trainers. And you said, and there you know that they're produced in horrible sweatshop conditions, right? And uh, you said to the person, no, I, I don't want to take your Nike Das, Nike Das sleep, sleepers, because I don't want to encourage them to produce any more by giving them money. You, and the other person responded. I, I responded and say, don't worry, I stole them. <laughs> 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 or, or maybe that's not so good. That carries over something else. Maybe, don't worry, I just found them. Don't worry, they were free. They were giveaways. It's actually cost them money to produce it, and I haven't given them anything. I just found them on the side of the street. And then you say, well, it has that Nike Das label on it. And if I wandered around with these Nike Das shoes, then people would think I was you know, endorsing it, and, and then I thought what Nike Das was up to was a good thing. I said, don't worry, don't worry. I'll remove the labels so nobody can tell what they are. And they're not like your shoes that are really distinctive. They're really plain, bland shoes, kind of thing I would wear. And nobody could tell, right? I think you'd still have a reason not to accept them. And the reason would be is that wearing those shoes would make you complicit in the original wrongdoing. And I'm going to talk about why. Let's move to Alaska. No. Let's not go to Alaska. Let's go to climate change. One of the reasons why theorists have become really interested in climate change, well, it's probably two reasons. One, it looks pretty bad, catastrophic. And that's interesting in the same way the train wrecks are interesting. But there's another reason, a theoretic interest in this area, which is that climate change has certain interesting characteristics. It's not unique to climate change. But these interesting characteristics are presented in a forceful, catastrophic fashion. And that's, we've got something that's clearly wrongful, right? We can clearly think there's something problematic about climate change, right? Yet, or at least the effects of climate change. When I say climate change, I really mean the effects of it, okay? And yet, it's not something that we can easily attribute to any particular agent. It's indeed a, a product of a large number, millions of billions of individual uncoordinated acts. That so climate change is a, an effect, as it were, a circumstance, which is a product of a large number, it's a large end set of uncoordinated actions. And our conventional treatment of morality is not like that. We're mostly at home with moral judgments that are unique to individuals, right? So if I'm driving a car, smash it into somebody, we say, on, you know, small, you know, a bunch of school children on the side of the road, right? It's very easy to say what I've done is wrong, you know how it's wrong, you say, look, Steve, you caused the death of all those people, right? But in these circumstances, our moral judgments are going to have to become, well, at least suggesting that they might come unhinged from conventional causal mechanisms. Now, of course, those of us who do sophisticated moral ethical theory will already be suspicious about the causal structure anyways, right? But in this case, things like climate change really force us to move far away from causal structures to explain our moral judgments. So that's one of the things that's interesting about climate change. The thing that I'm going to be interested in about climate change today, the thing that's going to show up at um, basically number one, right, is that um, the World Health Organization argues that 150,000 deaths per annum can be attributed currently to climate change. These arise from um, extreme weather events, from changes in disease vectors, and from uh, increases in f or decreases, I should say, of food production. And of course, these things work in positive feedback cycles. If you can't eat very much, you're more likely to get diseased. They, uh, you know, characterized by uh, poverty, disease, and, and low food production means that communities are less resilient to extreme weather events, which cause lower food production, and so on and so forth. Right. So you might think generally these, you know, these factors decrease the resilience of communities, making them you know, vulnerable. So that's the one thing I'm going to point out. If that turns out to be false, then my entire argument falls down. But I don't know anything about science, so I'm just going to blame the people at the World Health Organization if that's, if that's not true. It's also true that oil industry 
is a major contributor to climate change. I'm going to emphasize the use of the term contributor. I'm not going to use the term cause. Okay. So now let's go to Alaska. Alaska's economy floats on an ocean of oil. Oil is responsible for about, or sorry, gives rise to about 81% of Alaska's state revenue. It's worth about $50,000 per annum per family in Alaska. It is about one in three jobs are indirectly related. Not directly, indirectly. Uh, direct employment is about 5,000 5, Alaskans. In, in some ways, Alaska is kind of like, it has a version of what's sometimes called Dutch disease. And, and it's exacerbated by a relatively low population density, large um, you know, land mass to manage. So oil is really important to Alaska. And moreover, they get the PD, PFD, the Permanent Fund Dividend. What's that, you're asking? The Permanent Fund Dividend is money that's paid to every Alaskan every year if they apply for it on the basis of them being Alaska, them being resident in Alaska for six months. The money is derived from the taxation of oil extraction. So it's not the case they don't tax oil sales or the use or anything like that. They tax the companies who are pulling the oil out of the ground on a per barrel basis. Right? That money goes into a big sovereign wealth fund and a small tranche of it is distributed every year to every Alaskan who applies for it. That's why my friend Carl got really interested in the model, because what you're describing sounds a lot like a basic income model. And a basic income, of course, is the thing that I'm interested in sort of more broadly here. Which, does anybody here, has anybody here ever done basic income before? Looked at basic income things before? All right, I'll explain. It's very simple. A basic income is an income that is universal, unconditional, guaranteed, permanent, and regular. Is that a question, or is that just a... No? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can ask questions a little bit. Cool. Right. That has these five characteristics. Okay? Political theorists become interested in, well, probably not the only people, who become interested in basic income as a, in some respects, as an alternative to some of the problems that are seen with means testing, uh, un un means tested universal benefits, and the various different concerns that arise out of that. Universal ba basic incomes are not means tested. Everybody would get one. And why would they get one? Well, you might have a number of different justifications. The particular justification that I'm interested in is the one advanced by libertarians. So if you're a libertarian, you're committed to the sort of fundamental principle of every person's equal life right to be free. And you'd be interested in a basic income because it's going to realize freedom. Right? But of course, you have to find a way to fund it. Right? If you're going to give people lots of money, Say the Alaskan case is a thousand bucks per year. Uh, most people who um, favor basic income favor uh, uh, values that are north of that thousand bucks a year. The Alaskan one varies a bit. Um, some people think that it should be as high as so that sufficiently high that anybody could opt out of the employment uh, anybody could opt out of the employment market without cost. Or some people think that. Um, we should just provide a sufficient amount so people can just barely survive. That would be the basic income. Okay? But at the end of the day, it's not means tested, it's unconditional, it's permanent, and it's going to be regular. That's what characterizes it. I'm interested somewhat in targeting those libertarians because one of the reasons they would favor the basic income, the PDFD models, targeting of taxation on natural resource revenue, is that comparatively, they might think that it avoids a particular problem attached to other funding models, funding models that derive their resources, their money, from the taxation of wealth or income. If you're a libertarian, you're not going to be overly keen on taxation. You're going to think that people have rights to their properties, part of the, part of the, the sort of package of being free. And so you're going to think that's a moral cost as it were associated with any form of redistributive taxation. But if you're taxing extraction of natural resources, you don't have to worry about taking people's money. Because, well, you might think of a number of different things. You might think nobody owns natural resources, natural resources. You might think everybody owns natural resources. You might think the state owns them and we all sort of own the state. Or you might think the state operates as like a fiduciary with respect to humanity, you, whatever it is. But you don't think that they are originally owned by individuals. They're in a state of nature. That's why they're natural resources. 
So that's so in some respects this paper is targeted at those people. But what I would kind of want to say, you might you guys might be interested in more broader questions, but the finer point that I make is that if you endorse this model for those reasons, those that's not a good reason to endorse because there's moral burdens on the model that arise from this complicity attribution. But for you that may not be such a big deal. So I talked a bit about oil in Alaska, talked about basic income, talked about the PDF, and talked a little bit about complicity. Now I'm going to talk about climate change, and then I'll work through how climate change, how people, how Alaskans are complicit in climate change through a, another model that I'll call fire bombing. Okay? It's always exciting. People always get blown up and stuff with pipe hammers. Okay, so climate change. In 2008, humanity produced about 250 million barrels of oil. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we used about 250. Oh, sorry. Uh, looking at the wrong data. Back up. Ignore humanity for a minute. <laughs> Just to focus on the Alaskans. Alaska produced 250 million barrels of oil in 2008. And that works out to about 3.5% sorry, 3 of U.S. consumption. US the Americans in 2008 consumed about 7.14 billion barrels of oil. In terms of global consumption, now we're humanity, that works out to about 0.79% of global consumption. So 250 barrels, million barrels, 2008 for Alaskans, 0.8% of global consumption. You know, it's not a huge number, but it's significant, right? Moving to climate change, we produced about, in humans, we produced about 5,833 million metric tons of CO2 in 2008. And the Americans, they produced 19% of the total. It's obvious why I'm using, because I'm talking about Alaska, that's why I'm using American data, right? Okay. Of which, that 19% of that was uh, carbon dioxide production, 42% of that is distributable to petroleum oil. So working roughly, okay, Steve does a bit of math, you know, carry the two. Uh, so, so those of you who know me will know that don't trust anything from this point forward. <laughs> I figure that Alaska was uh, responsible for roughly about 85.26 million metric tons. Now, it might change the, the, the argument if Alaska was, say, more efficient or less efficient with their work oil, but it's not going to change my point. Okay? It works out to being about 0.0027% of so Alaska oil is about 0.0027 percent of global carbon production. Not very much, I said. If it didn't happen, we probably wouldn't notice. So one thing you might say out of this, and this gets back to something I was saying earlier, is that Alaskans aren't causing climate change. Because if the Alaskans stop doing it, climate change would sort of roll on unaffected. Now suppose you deny this, right? Suppose you have a theory of causation that doesn't have, doesn't imply that. If not, then not structure, counterfactual structure. That's fine. If you want to say that Alaska is contributing to causing climate change, then you're only going to be further on my side. But I'm not relying on a causation argument to make my point. So I'm not going to claim that the problem Alaska oil is that it's causing climate change. It's not the mechanism for the moral charge. Instead, it's an argument about complicity. OK, so we've had global warming, killing about 150,000 people per year. And I want to suggest that oil is a major contributor. The oil industry is a major contributor. Well, why, how, how, what am I saying when I say that? One thing I'm not saying is that oil extraction is itself wrongful. I think people could merely engage in oil extraction probably ad nauseum, and not do anything wrong. Maybe they make it into swimming pools or something like that, right? Um, they don't burn it into the atmosphere where it does the damage. Or we have circumstances where most people in this world are not, they're engaged in a low carbon lifestyle, but we've got a few isolated individuals who just persistently drive around in their 57 Chevys, you know, with pollutants firing out the back, right? But if there's only a small number of these people, then it won't give rise to the threshold effects that, will cause, that, are, uh, that constitute climate change. So oil extraction, oil use is not in itself wrongful. 
Some malamin say like driving buses through school children, not with school, through them. Yes. So that's not what I'm saying. Instead, my charge targets the industry as a practice that foreseeably and as a normal feature of which produces CO2. So there's the that's that's the that's the important bit. Okay. That what's special about the oil industry is that the deaths attributable to it, deaths attributed to the to climate change, to which the oil industry is a major contributor, are perfectly normal and foreseeable results. They're what we would expect from an industry like that. They're not accidents. They're not something that's happening that's out of the normal or whatever. That's what the industry is designed to do. If the oil industry was designed to produce, well, I don't know, petroleum jelly, right? If that was the main use of petroleum, right? That was that we produce petroleum jelly. Then my argument would not carry. My argument only carries if we think it was a central feature of the oil industry that it's designed to extract and produce and burn. Pardon. Sorry. Sorry. Wow, petroleum being carbon. It will rapidly become apparent to anybody here that yeah, I don't really even know how climate change works. I don't know how to do the math. I don't know. What I am good at is the complicity argument, and we're going to get to that in a second. Okay. As an analogy, you might take um, arms manufacturers, right? Guns don't kill people. People kill people, according to the uh, some people, anyways. But I, I don't think that's plausible. I think if you're engaged in the production of um, AK-47s or something like that. You can't walk away and say, oh, you know, I didn't mean for that to happen. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it wasn't a foreseeable result <laughs> you know, when, I, you know, when, I, when I was involved with this thing. Right? So it's, it's like that, kind of, there's going to be an analogous kind of industry. Okay. But now as a caveat, you give some, you take some. Uh, my argument's not going to be, I think, sufficient to say that we should ban oil industries or anything like that. I'll get back to that in a second, maybe. Complicity is kind of like love or friendship. You can't do it on your own. You have to have other people involved. Now, Jen, uh, there's a lawyer will tell us, right? She'll say, look, complicity works like this. Right? There's an action that's wrongful, that's engaged in by principles, and then other people are complicit with it around. So, like, say you and I were planning a bank robbery, right? And we, um, we got you involved, you were going to, you know, I don't know, truck the car. you're driving the car, right? You might be something like, well, I think that you're complicit in it, right? To some extent, right? Well, we're the principal. We get in there with the guns and hold the, hold the people up, right? You're peripheral to our action. That might work, complicity might work that way. And that's how it works in, 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 in certain legal systems. But as I said to you, I'm talking about a more diffuse lay conception where wrongdoing here can be emergent out of the uncoordinated actions of a large number of individuals. I'm not talking about a joint action, because climate change is not an action. So what is it that with which we, and how is it then, we would be complicit? Because we're not coordinating our actions with a set of principles who are engaged in an action, a wrongful action. Instead, our uncoordinated large numbers of people in an overdetermined situation, right? All of these are problematic points, right? Large numbers of people that are not coordinated, who are in an overdetermined situation. Overdetermined means that it would happen no matter what, even if we stopped doing it, the evil would still occur. So let's walk through firebombing. And as we walk through the case of firebombing, I want to isolate three elements of agency which will allow us to make a contributing attribute, a complicity attribution. Okay, so firebombing. Now I've stolen firebombing from a guy named Christopher Cutts. Now, if you, can you, remember, you guys all have some visions of some historical fire bombings in your head, you know, Dresden, Tokyo, right? Put those out of your mind, okay? This fire bombing is different from all of those because there's no way it's justified. This case of fire bombing is really bad. It's evil. There's no reason to do it, okay? Now, for those of you who haven't been familiar with fire bombing, this is how a fire bombing mission works. You get a large number of planes, load them up with incendiary devices, and then you drop them on the city, right? But you don't try to kill anybody with your bombs. Instead, you try to light the city on fire. And you hope that a significant number of fires will join together in a conflagration and create a firestorm. And that firestorm will sweep the city. And then it will kill people, not just with the flames, but also with, um, with the, uh, the take all the oxygen out of the way and suffocate people. Use the city itself as a weapon against the inhabitants. 
So here we've got another overdetermined structure. Right? Any single person stops their fire, you know, doesn't engage, doesn't go along with the fire bombing. That emergent event, circumstances of the, the wrong, the firestorm, will still occur. Right? It's morally the same kind of thing, though in terms of types you might distinguish. But morally, it's the same event that will occur. Right? But it's not an action. In our case of firebombing, we have a large number of people who are engaged in coordinated actions, which are coordinated with each other. So this may be one way in which this different from climate change, right? One way, place where you might say the analogy doesn't carry. Okay. But it's not an action. It's a product of a large number of people engaged in a coordinated set of actions. The firebombing itself is not an action since it's not in the compass of any particular agent. I think agencies and actions are closely linked. If it's an action, it needs to be linked with an agent. That's a kind of that singular character that is important to our moral understanding of each other, and right? that we can tie certain events to particular people, give them ownership of it. Okay? So any account of complicity is going to have to retain that ownership, attribution, singularity. Now imagine we've got an aircraft mechanic, and they've got no intention to kill. Right? But nevertheless, we might blame her for her actions in firebombing, right? She's working away on a strut, it's a bomber, the bomber's gonna carry the incendiaries. If she knows all this stuff, well, then I think we can quite rightly hold her responsible, morally responsible for what happens. Maybe she has a portion of it, but she has a, how we fine tune this doesn't really matter for my purposes. All I wanna say is that there is a moral burden on this person. She ought not to have done what she had done. Ignorance sometimes it sculpts, but we live in a morally complex world, and we are constantly having to intervene in it. Um, so ignorance often doesn't sculpt people. Sometimes people ought to have known what they're up to. The test in law is reasonable foreseeability. And sometimes people can become complicit through rashness, rash behavior, or negligent behavior. All these can meet the three tests, the three criteria, which you're going to set up now. That is, she interposes herself into the event. She's in control of her activity with regard to the event. And then she aligns her agency in some ways to promote, fulfill, or endorse the event. Okay, so there's our three conditions. Are these true of our aircraft mechanic? Well, yeah. She's interposing herself in the event. She's fixing the strut, which is part of the plane, which is part of the firebombing. She's in control of her agency. She's not, let's in, the, in this case, you know, she's not being forced into it. She's not being coerced. She's not uh, doing this under the operations of some drugs or anything like that. Okay. And moreover, she's aligning her agency with it. She's attempting to promote the end, which the firebombing is aimed at. She's not trying to counter it. She's not sabotaging it. She's not just accidentally uh, working here. If we think that those are sufficient and necessary conditions for the attribution of complicity, I'll go slower. If those are sufficient and necessary conditions for the attribution of complicity, then we have an account that can manage the overdetermined large N, large numbers of uncoordinated actions or so is my claim. I'll finish up in about three to four minutes by returning to Alaska. In Alaska, people who want to get a PDF, no, PFD, every day they have to sign up for it. And I'm gonna focus in on that way in which they become complicit. There may be other ways. I'm just gonna focus in on that annual registration process. Because a PFD is not banned from heaven, it's not a public good, it's not not excludable, it's a private good that you get a couple of bucks in your pocket. Every year you have to sign up and say, I'm gonna do it. And people know that it comes from the oil industry, it's not a secret, it's actually very public, you know, they sort of celebrate it, you know. This is the oil industry giving back to Alaska kind of thing, right? So they're not being coerced, you can reasonably impute knowledge and moreover, anybody who doesn't know what's happening with climate change has been living under a rock for a while. Which actually in Alaska might not be crazy. Some of the people there <laughs> might not know. So there may be some Alaskans who get off, as it were. But most of them are not, are, we can impute, reasonably impute that they know or ought to know what's happening with climate change. So with those conditions, I say that they're interposing themselves with respect to the event, aligning their agency and they're in control of it we make the complicity attribution. And then I say, look, to the libertarian or whatever, now this model is on all fours 
with any other model, with any other concern that you might have. Now, maybe you want to weight these things up, right? You might say, well, your taxation model is more bad in it than in my um, sovereign wealth model for basic income. Right? But first, I say, well, okay, well, I don't really know how to do that sort of moral weighting thing, or if I, it would take me a lot to try to figure out how to do it. But there's another thought, is that we could try to save the model. And this thought, I, I actually didn't really come up with this myself. I, I stole this from Christian Berry. But I shouldn't say I stole it, because when I gave the paper the first time at the A&U, that's where I stopped right there. And Christian said, hold on a second. I think I can, ma I can make you happy and the basic income guys happy. So I'll finish with that, how we might save the model. I began with um, the thought that we live in a morally complex world. And sometimes this world is tragic. And what I mean by tragic is that there is no, sometimes no good, morally good option. We have to engage in morally um, actions that burden us morally. Right? And sometimes, if the costs are too much, we, this can give a reason to engage in wrongful behavior. The bank teller, who with the gun in her head, is the sort of classic example, right? She ought not to give a hint the, th the thief the money, but nevertheless, we excuse her because the costs are so high. Okay. In Alaska, the cost of, the, of stopping oil extraction would be incredibly high. Originally, I said 82 or 81 percent of the Alaska state budget comes from oil. One in three jobs, fifty thousand dollars per year per family, and moreover, basic income might realize people's freedom. Freedom's a pretty good good. If anything's going to justify climate change, it would be the realization of individual freedom. So say it, the libertarian. <laughs> If you're not a libertarian, you don't so strongly endorse that, but you can still think that, that it'd be pretty good to give people enough money so that they would be able to, you know, opt out of um, coercive labor markets or whatever, right? So if we could clean up the model, that would be a really good thing. And so the idea here is that, well, what was the original problem? The original problem is 150,000 deaths per annum. If we could get rid of those, then my whole complicity argument falls by the wayside, right? It doesn't apply because the original argument hangs on the on that wrongdoing, the, the, the unjustified moral rights violations. There, if those disappeared, then we wouldn't have any reason to be concerned. So the thought is this: What if we use the money from oil to mitigate or to advert? So I call this the advert funding model. Those deaths. If we use money derived from the extraction of oil to pay off, so we got rid of all of those deaths, then there'd be no reason to be concerned on my argument. You see what I'm doing here, right? Take them from one, Peter, to pay off the other side, and then we don't have to worry about the, at least this argument. Maybe other arguments apply, but they'll solve this problem. So the component, the basic income pro program would have two components, at least. One would be the conventional payments to individuals in order to uh, realize the fundamental elements of the basic income. And two would be this advert funding, paying, paying to advert uh, debts that would otherwise be attributable to climate change. Now you might come back and say, well, hold on. Alaskans aren't in it for 150,000 deaths. Like, there are a lot of other people involved. Indeed, as we saw, Alaskan oil is only contributing about 0.0027% of uh, carbon emissions per annum. So I thought, well, one rough and ready way to go about this would be to do it on a contributory basis. So if 150,000 divided by 0.02 Sorry, 0.0027 works out about 405, 405 deaths per annum. So if the Alaskans could advert 405 deaths per annum, we might think that we could save the model. Now that would be a good place to finish the paper, but I actually think, because I'm a theorist, I got to attack the <coughs> ending points here. That's a pretty crude proposal. And indeed, the idea of contributory responsibility as a sole condition is very implausible. Um, there may be lots of other reasons. Uh, but one thing we could say about that proposal is that it would have an internal incentive. Because if the funding is costing us money, right? The funding option that we choose, we choose oil, it's going to cost us money over here to pay for the advert funding, right? If we choose other funding models, maybe, you know, in a green world, right? You know, Alaska has lots of wind, solar, um, da uh, hydroelectric dams, and um, tidal resources. So we use a bit more of that, we don't have to pay as much for our advert. Funding. So there's an internal incentive in the model to reduce the amount of money spent on mitigating or adverting 
otherwise attributable deaths. And so with that, I sent the, I sent the paper off to Carl. Uh, he's really upset. And he's been, he's been sending me back missives about this now for six months. The papers have gone, like, we've probably written something like 100 pages in order to produce a 10 page paper. <laughs> and at the end of the day, actually I was gonna reproduce what he recently just rushed to press without even showing me. <laughs> he, published, he published a retraction of my paper before it was even published. <laughs> Anyways, so with that, I'll close. Carl's, should I say, still upset.